I have the great pleasure, I can see Alicia's already there, um, of introducing our next speaker. So, Alicia, I think your camera's working. Are we able to just check your mic's working as well? Yeah. Hello, hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank great. you. Um, so, Alicia is a professor, psychotherapist, psychologist, linguist, licensed coach and an international master trainer. She holds the position of president of the International Coaching Institute in Poland and is head of the Language Centre Future. She is an author of books and over 300 articles published in Polish and English and co-author of the recently published book, Process Drama for Second Language Teaching and Learning, a toolkit for developing language and life skills. She has been researching and practicing drama for years and her main interest is psychology and drama in the ELT classroom. She actively works with teachers, school managers and pupils on developing their well-being and resilience. And today um, she will be discussing trauma-informed education. So I'll pass right on over to you, Alistia, um, so that you can get started. I'll just grab your slides. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for a very kind introduction. <laughs> it's really fantastic to be here and, be, and really to be a part of this amazing event. So welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining me. I can see people from different countries, also some people from Poland. So welcome all of you. I love the session by of Patrick. It's going to be a little bit different because we are going to talk about trauma, which is quite a serious and difficult topic, but there will be some things in common which will somehow link our two sessions. So um, I think that with more than uh, 84 million displaced people living in the world, actually we can't avoid talking about trauma and uh, the well-being of refugees is now a global crisis. So we as educators, as teachers, we are all somehow responsible for providing high quality and accessible education for displaced children and for newcomers. Uh, so I think that it's it's important both for teachers and also our our students to to have a better understanding what our what newcomers or refugee kids or students have gone through and somehow provide them with with acceptance and uh, and warm welcome um, in my opinion uh, it's really important to offer some social and, and emotional learning not only for refugees but also for our own students in our classrooms and also it's important for us I think that pandemic of COVID-19 has proved how important how important interpersonal and intrapersonal skills are so um, with our social and emotional skills, we're not really able to uh, to control our, our emotions, to regulate the emotions and take proper care of, of our resilience. Um, I think that um, it's quite known probably for all of you, but we have been living in, a, in the age of chaos. And the acronym VUCA, which is actually introduced in, in 1985, is not a new thing, but um, uh, it's quite apt for the, for, the, for the times we have been living in. So VUCA stands for, uh, the acronym stands for Volatility, uncert Uncertainty, Complexity, Ambiguity. And actually is a, is a combination of qualities which somehow characterize the nature of some difficult conditions and situations. It was first introduced by military strategists and, tra and trainers uh, who were trying to explain uh, the change in military operations post uh, Cold War. But under that, behind this acronym, actually there is a sense of danger and unpredictability. And I think the year 2020, uh, proved that the only predictable thing in our life is or was unpredictability. This acronym has been even more developed recently, and now we talk about BUNNY, which stands for Brittle Anxiety, Non-Linearity and Incomprehensibility. And I think we can all agree that uh, actually none of us is sure of the future. We don't know how our world would look like. Uh, so we have to learn how to live with this unpredictable reality. And in this session, I would like to 
talk a little bit about trauma, how trauma can be manifested, how, can it, how it can be uh, expressed, and also what behavior, which we observe in our classroom, can be the results of trauma students or pupils or even adults have gone through. Um, so this is the, the, the outline of the session, and I will try quickly as uh, as we have not that much time to you know to to focus on each uh, point mm, too much uh i will try to cover it so let's start to talk about manifestations of of trauma but uh, to talk about it i would like you to think about emotions because all of us experience emotions and i think you will agree that uh, that it's impossible to learn without emotions that actually emotions and learning are some somehow inseparable so we know that emotions can both enhance or interfere with the learning depending actually what we feel um Cognitive learning is absolutely imp is impossible to isolate them from the affective one. And we know that the emotions are linked to, to some cognitive skills. They influence cognitive skills such as memory, as attention, as some decision making or uh, some executive function or uh, problem solving, many, many others. And uh, when you think about your own learning process, try to remember the moment when you were really sad or you had really a not very positive emotional state, how it influenced the way you learned. Because, you know, we can't isolate ourselves from the emotions. That's why very often we say that the physical and emotional state is really important in our learning environment. And we as teachers, we are, we are responsible for creating positive learning environment. I very often say that the emotions can be defined as memory markers. I don't know if you agree with me, but, but when you experience something emotionally, you will remember it more and better for longer. Of course, it's, it's really essential to create positive emotions such as curiosity, interest, passion or creativity because when you experience it with this passion, it will stay much longer in your mind. Yeah? And I'm sure that you can, uh, you can uh, remember some moments in your life when you were really emotionally engaged in, in your learning process and then we still remember it. I remember teachers who really uh, somehow awakened uh, positive emotions in me. So, um, yes, yeah, so emotions are really, really important in our, in our life. And coming on the back of the global pandemic, which, as we all know, had a really devastating toll on our mental health, all the news or information about, about the war um, somehow compounded the fear of uns the, the, the feeling of fear and uncertainty. People can have different emotions connected with conflicts and wars, like sadness, anger, compassion, anxiety, helplessness, many others, you know. We can experience different feelings, we can react differently. And it's also important to remember that uh, it's actually a very, very individual response, how you react even to the traumatic situation. But probably the most common uh, feeling or emotion which we all feel when we are under the pressure, when you experience war or any conflict is anxiety. It's anxiety and fear. Yeah, so what is anxiety and fear? Um, you, you, I'm sure that all of us have experienced the, the, the feeling of fear because we can be frightened by, by many different things. But fear is, in a way, a natural feeling which uh, warns people of danger and threats. When you, when you look at some psychological definitions, it's probably one of the common, common um, definitions. So the, the feeling of, of anxiety somehow alerts the body and it's, it's like a, a reaction to stress. You know, because we feel the stress also in our body, it increases the level of adrenaline. And in, in a situation when we experience high level of anxiety or fear, uh, we usually try to weigh the danger of situation and we try to, uh, try to assess or choose the option for action, what to do, how to react. Uh, in psychology, we say that there are three different reactions to stress or to, to any anxiety or fear experience like flight, waiting or attack. Of course, we can manifest these uh, responses in a very different way. 
And when you when we look at some physical somatic manifestations of, of anxiety, there are many of them. But just to remind you some, or you can you can also think about your anxieties uh, you have experienced or fear. Usually you can observe some breathlessness, feeling of feelings of panic, we feel chest pain, you can have like irregular heart rate, you can have a stomach ache, you can have a headache, indigestion, insomnia, and many, many others. It's, it's again very, very individual. Sometimes you can, you can have the feeling of shame, you can have the feeling of isolation. All these emotions are intercorrelated. And and in not only on physical level we experience uh, anxiety or fear, but it's also, it also affects our mental and emotional life. And we often say that uh, when you experience uh, trauma or, uh, or stress, the, the psychological symptoms of these dissociative disorders, they are called like that in psychology, can be depersonalization and derealization dissociation and so-called emotional hibernation. So depersonalization is, is a feeling of um, being disconnected or dis detached from one's body of thoughts. Uh, you, maybe you have experienced something like that. Like you, you feel as if you were outside your body and or like being in a dream in a way that you are observing yourself from so-called metaposition. You, you look at yourself, but you are not there. And also this feeling of being detached uh, very often uh, looks like not being able to feel emotions. You are you are absolutely, you know, um, indifferent to any emotions. And such uh, such disorders are very often caused by stress or traumatic event, or like war, like abuse, like any any violence. Um, so sometimes you talk to a person who is in a state of emotional hibernation but the person is not present you know you talk to this person and it, it looks as if you were as if the person was behind a glass ceiling or something like that so it's uh, it's I, I don't want to go into more details but it's really really um, a very serious uh, serious uh, emotional state and people people uh, with all these dissociative di disorders very often also suffer from sudden panic attacks. You know, they are like the sudden periods of intense anxiety. And this is, you can feel also sort of a physiological over suspension. And this during the panic attack, I think we, we could also have experienced sort of panic attacks sometimes. Again, you have some physiological symptoms and psychological symptoms. But what is quite typical is the sensation which disconnects us from reality. We are then focused only on, on ourselves. You know, the external world somehow disappears. It doesn't exist. So we look only on, our, on us, on what's going on in, in my in my uh, situation. And of course, uh, there are many sy symptoms of panic attack, which, which some, somehow are uh, similar to, to symptoms of anxiety. Very often you, you, are, you have like feeling of choking, you have trembling, shaking. You can have a high level of fear of dying or many of excessive sweating. And obviously any war, any conflict, alter our psychological health and wars definitely alter psychological health of populations which are exposed to violence and people experiencing such events may suffer from different disorders many people suffer from depression uh, anxiety post uh, traumatic stress disorder trauma as i said before even bipolar disorder or schizophrenia many different things um, and uh, the feeling of anxiety, as I said, it's just the, the, the reaction to stress. But when somebody is under a long-lasting stress, then we talk about so-called post-traumatic uh, disorder. And it's not easy. It's not easy to come back to normal state. Trauma, in psychological sense, consists of, uh, consists of mental state 
resulting from occurrence of something very difficult of external factors and when we when we experience trauma it may it may result really in uh, persisting diffi persistent diffi difficulties to come back to the functioning before the trauma so after trauma, we can observe like severe reaction to stress and severe uh, stress disorder. So when you think about people who have gone through, through trauma connected with wars or dislocation, we can ask ourselves which experience, which experiences uh, cause stress or trauma for refugees because it's a very specific trauma. Yes? It's a very specific trauma and um, First of all, I think living and sometimes fleeting violent situations. When you live in a really violent situation, you observe what's happening around you. When you observe, when you're witnessing violence happening just a few meters from you, it may have a really big impact on your stress level. Many people lost their families, they lost mothers, fathers, they lost their they, they partners, husbands, wives. Here now in Poland, we have so many people from Ukraine who lost their beloved. And kids, even if they are very young, they are, they are still very small, they, they can feel the stress the parents have. You know, children are very sensitive and sometimes we, we don't think that they understand what's happening, but they do and then undertaking dangerous, stressful journeys, journeys to safety. Again, you never know what, what you can expect. You don't know how people in different countries will welcome you. You don't know what's happening, what will happen in the classroom. You don't know what your status in a new country will be. Is it permanent or not? And there are so many different wars and conflicts in, in the world that I think uh, wherever you live, you can observe it and you, you, can, you can feel it. And sometimes just living in very poor housing with some limited resources, it's also, it, it, it also can cause stress or trauma. Um, why am I saying that? Because when you are... Uh, when you have experienced trauma, when you experience such a high level of stress, then you can behave differently. And people, especially our, our students, kids we have uh, in our classrooms, they can present different behaviors. And if we don't know what, what stands behind the behavior, we can think that they are just very naughty. Yeah. And I think it's quite important to understand that when you have students coming to your classroom, they are bringing like a pack bag full of different emotions and experiences. Even if they are not refugees, you know, behind each behavior, there is a reason. I always tell my teachers and people I work with, I work a lot with medical doctors, I always tell uh, the doctors that even if the if the patient is aggressive or not nice, there must be the reason behind that behavior. And especially when we look about, uh, at our students, our uh, our kids, tr let's look a little bit behind, uh, because the experience and emotions they bring can completely change the way they be, uh, they behave. Usually, some traumatic experiences cause students to feel powerless, unseen, and unheard. And it leads, of course, to very difficult emotions, uh, which, they, which kids or students also experience in our classrooms. And they often communicate what they, uh, they what they feel through, through behaviors, which are traditionally labeled like as challenging behaviors. We are having difficult kids with challenging behaviors. Hmm? We can observe very different uh, different symptoms of this behavior. Try to think about uh, kids which are not the easiest one in your classrooms. And it doesn't matter really if they are newcomers and, and refugees or just kids uh, who cause uh, some trouble for you when you teach English. Because there are many different symptoms of, uh, um, of the behavior. And it's important to know the story which goes behind, which stands behind this behavior, as I said. We, now we talk a, little, a lot about so-called narrative education, narrative medicine, and now it's narrative education. So just go into the narrative of the kid, of the student. 
because they can they can uh, behave differently. They can avoid contact. They can have some learning difficulties. They can be even aggressive or repressive. They can have definitely a very low level of self confidence, self esteem. Sometimes they they just lack uh, lack uh, safety awareness, or they can have like difficulty difficulty focusing on what you are trying to teach them, or they are very forgetful, or they can have like what happens very often frequent complaints of feeling sick. I'm sure that you can even add to this list. Yeah, because because they then they try to somehow to survive or they try to be seen because from what from what I said, you know, they try to be noticed. Uh, uh, trauma causes people to feel unseen, unheard, powerless. So um, how to talk about these painful issues? how to help these kids because believe me uh we as teachers you as teachers you have absolutely amazing enormous power to change every kid's life and depending how you react what you do how you show the acceptance empathy it will ha it it might have uh just amazingly positive impact on their life so how to talk to kids uh about painful issues. First of all, students need to know uh, how to behave in these crisis situations. It's not easy, absolutely not easy. I have been talking to many teachers around the world and many of them feel just lost because we, we don't know how to do it, yeah? how to support somebody who has suddenly appeared in the classroom uh, experiencing like death of mother or dad. And also it's difficult to integrate uh, the newcomers with the with the group, it's not easy, uh, especially that each student, each child is different and has a different situation, and we can't just have one one pattern what to do. So um, I usually say that we should employ like trauma informed uh, social emotional uh, learning strategies. Uh, first of all, it's just the awareness of the signs of trauma. So if you have sort of toolkit of strategies to help students, because it's important not to re-traumatize the kids, the students, they have already gone through trauma. Um, so it's important to establish really healthy relationships with them, uh, provide just really safe space in the schools with positive interactions, with acceptance, with unconditioned regard, even with some really kind words. This is something very simple and basic. We can, everybody can do it, but it's important to remember about it. So this social, uh, social and emotional learning is like really effective vehicle uh, for normalizing trauma-informed pedagogy in our classroom. To do it, we need some pedagogical intuition. Yeah. And because let's face the truth, uh, we cannot solve the problems in a student's life, but we can give them back the power and assure them that they can they can feel seen, they can be they can feel heard in the classroom. And so we need to give them the space to process, give them the space to communicate their emotions in a safer and more productive way. And there's lots of research, as, as Kate said at the very beginning, it's one of my research questions and, and interest to, to research and investigate resilience and well-being of students and teachers and all factors connected with that on psychological uh, uh, basis. So research shows that the, the adverse effects of trauma can be mitigated by the presence of even just one empowering and empathetic presence in students' life. So it's, it's enough sometimes to have just one person who will show empathy, who will show acceptance, just to correct, to, you know, to, to cure uh, the child who has gone through the trauma. We, we often call it like corrective experience. Uh, it applies to, to, to people who went through trauma, but also not only trauma connected with wars, but also trauma which happened in our life. Uh, 
Just this corrective experience means that you need somebody who will unconditionally accept you, who will show you uh, empathy and love. To do it, it's also important to use empowering language. What kind of empowering language we can use? We can use words and phrases like you can, you are able to do it. Yeah? It's better to unlock the potential of the child, like, you know, go back to the emotional state the student is and just uh, make him feel like a victim because it, it will not work for a long uh, time. So pedag pedagogical intuition, empathy, some gentleness, tact. It's, as I'm saying, guys, it's not easy, I know, but I'm sure that we can do it. Yeah, because uh, we, we can't avoid it. I know that here we are all uh, teachers of English, but the role of teachers has shifted totally, you know, because many students can just open internet and learn the knowledge, but they will never learn this intrapersonal, interpersonal skills. And what they really need is your presence. Um, and to do it, we need to create like trauma sensitive learning environment, just to be to be sensitive. What does it mean to, to sense to be sensitive and to create this, uh, this environment? It means to find time to listen when the child, when your student wants to talk, not pushing the child. And believe we in our world, uh, sometimes we talk a lot, but we can't listen. People can't listen. I often say that we need some, something called mindful listening. And sometimes pupils do not, or students do not want to talk. They need some time. Or as I said, they can be in this hibernation state. Maybe they have just gone through the horrible stress and they don't want to talk about it. Yeah? But if you, if you assure them that you are there, you are ready and you are available, it's enough. And it's important not to make assumptions about student experiences. Because sometimes we try to guess, we make some assumptions. Leave it. Just leave it. You are available to talk if the student wants you to talk. Also building some um, a class contract. I've, I find it really very important because we have a mixture of different students, different kids. And you, if you have some clear rules which can be applied in a crisis situation, they will help. They will help the newcomers, but they will also help students who you have in your classes for many years. They are very, very useful, especially when there are some crisis situations. Again, stress and disorientations this is something natural. We have to accept it. When somebody has a high level of stress, we'll react different. We know from our own experiences that that's how it is. So rules might prove significant for everyone. They're, they are very useful. But also what, what is needed is just trying to be very flexible, trying to be agile. As We talk a lot about agility now in education. So when you have really difficult topics, be conscious, be aware. Maybe it's not the topic you should cover during this lesson in this in this group, because your task is to provide a safe venue for, for students to process, to ask questions, to understand what's happening in the world. And what is really, really important is noticing students' strengths. You know, they pride in the culture. We can use we can do lots of cultural project, as Patrick was explaining in the previous session. We have to uh, make them feel as they are an important element in a school community, that everybody is, is important. And even if they come from a completely different culture, we all can somehow benefit from all these cultural elements. So coming to the emotions, how to deal with difficult emotions in the classroom. We all have difficult emotions and we all have somehow to deal with them. The first rule is just to accept the emotions. Um, there is nothing worse than suppression of emotions. Now I'm talking as a psychotherapist, of course, but believe me, emotions have to be expressed and they are subject of interpretation when you verbalize your emotions, when you translate them into words, then you can better control them. And even if, if they are not easy, if they are difficult, you need to accept that they might happen. 
because that's a natural reaction to what happens in your life. But remember that when the intensity or anxiety is in a very high, on a very high level, then we lose this ability to verbalize emotions. That's what, what we were discussing before about this hibernation, about, about, uh, about this numbness, emotional numbness. But how can we help our students to express emotions? There are many different uh, exercises. There are many different uh, techniques. Of course, one of them is practicing mindfulness. I have been doing many, many research, lots of research and many projects on using mindfulness in the classroom. And definitely all evidence proves how important and how effective mindfulness can be. I will show in the, in, in the end the, the, the link to the page where you can find some specifically uh, prepared mindfulness mindfulness for refugees. The other thing is uh, focusing on reality. Yeah, you need to uh, uh, you need to focus on something you can control. You know when? Oh, sorry, I'm too quick. Um, there are many exercises when uh, you can use in the classroom, which somehow help the student and also help you to focus on reality. Because we need to ask, ask ourselves, what do I have influence on? Yeah, We can't control the outcome of any world conflict, to be honest. But you can have, and your students can have control over the things just around us. Okay? Um, so, how much control you have over activities you take, you can have control on how much news you listen to, you can control, you can have control what you do during the day. That's very important. Sometimes, as I said, especially newcomers and refugees, they can't talk, they don't want to talk or they don't know the language. So we can use like nonverbal communication. So you can ask your students to share and discuss a color, a symbol, an image, which can represent how they are feeling right now. Easy, but very powerful and very effective. You can ask students to identify three thoughts they have about the current event, two questions they, might, they, they have, and one idea they have for moving forward. It's even a linguistic exercise you can, you can do with your, with your students. Um, there are many uh, possible exercises. Just the example, you can prepare in your classroom a jar of worries. Yes, and you can tell your students if they have any worry, they can write it down if they can, or they can draw a picture and put it into the jar. Just because putting it into, into the jar is somehow, you know, getting, getting it out of yourself. You can practice writing a journal of emotions. Some, I have been doing it with my students at the university, but just writing a journal of emotions, how you feel, because when you, when you write it down, then you can control what causes certain emotions, okay? Just, you know, simple thing, but write it down. And then when you go back, even me, believe me, sometimes when I look at my journal of emotion, how I feel like, you know, I can understand what caused me feel what caused me feel, feel really sad or anxious. You can, you can use also uh, Mitoko's uh, charades that students will choose the uh, Emotokinos, sorry, and just uh, show it. And the other, uh, the other students in the classroom can, can guess what it represents, how they feel. You can even build the emotional vocabulary. It's, again, a great linguistic exercise when they, when they write down all words, adjectives, or nouns which express emotions. Another one is to have a cum box. Uh, th this is like, you know, having a box where you write down the strategy, what makes you feel calm. Again, they can write or they can, or they can draw if they can't write. And then when they feel really anxious, they can choose from the box and use it. It's also an exercise which, which somehow supports collaboration in the classroom. Another exercise which I find, I find really very useful is so-called the blob tree. This is, a, this is a tool that can be used to help students, again, articulate their feelings and it also helps facilitate their development. So you have some 
look at the, at the, at the picture, you have some blob figures around the tree and you, you should ask your students, students to identify where they are, where they are on this blob tree. What are the emotions and what questions do they have being on this position? Yeah. This is uh, the blob tree was developed by Pete Wilson and there is a very well-known book called Games Without Frontiers where you can read about that. But it's really, really good. In psychology, we even have like interpretation of each position. I don't have enough time to explain each position, but maybe if you if you have questions, um, you can you can email me. So it's important to to ask your students which position they would identify with and why, because it definitely means something. Yeah. Okay, then again, there are lots of exercises to improve self-worth, self-confidence, uh, self and build a positive mindset. Again, you can ask your student to write positive diary. They can write like learning diary. What have you learned this week? What have you learned today? Or what positive, uh, have, what, po what positive thing have you experienced today? Or which of your strengths have you used today? Yeah, and... Uh, there are many other uh, many other uh, exercises. I also like the exercise called letter to yourself. So you ask your students uh, to write a letter. You can write actually three letters: letter to your future self. Mm -hmm. uh, so then you, uh, your students or children can write a letter to their future self about what they would like to do and accomplish, let's say, by the end of the school year. They, they are writing a letter to their future self. The second letter is writing a letter to your past self. So they should write about achievements they are proud of, something they have already done. Yeah, And the, the, maybe they can write about the mistakes they have learned from or what they, what they would have done differently because of the mistakes they have made. And then the third letter would be a letter to yourself uh, this is the letter when they try to uh, say thank you to, to, for something they have done this week. So quite useful, and it's also a writing exercise if you, uh, yes, if you um, if you want to teach writing skills. Maybe one more exercise is something called certificate of recognition. So you begin the, uh, this activity by assigning each student a classmate just for a week. And the task is to observe this, uh, this uh, student, the colleague for a week. And they, they shouldn't tell who they are observing. They shouldn't, uh, shouldn't share who they are observing for the week. And at the, the, at the end of the week, students create something called a certificate of recognition. Uh, celebrating something the students has done during the week. So they are preparing the, the certificate uh, for something like being kind, maybe for, for being active in an exercise, something they, they found really uh, special during the week. And then the following the week, you can tell your students that they are observing themselves this week. And at the end of the week, they are making a certificate of recognition to celebrate something positive, but they have done. Yes. So again, this is a very easy exercise to train the brain to look for positive and celebrate even small achievements. Because sometimes we accept really big things. We accept like the wow effect. But it's important to teach our kids and also to teach ourselves how to celebrate even really small things. So many ideas, but just to give you some examples. Okay, so all these elements uh, are important to, uh, to take care of our own and our students' well-being. Uh, of course... Uh, we need to be aware that uh, all these emotions which students experience, we also can experience, yes? And I would like now to ask you how you are feeling, what is your stress level, how you are coping with your stress, because teachers are under enormous, enormous pressure. And all research shows how stressed teachers are, 
and it's getting even worse and worse. We have lots of challenges. We have, we have to deal with so many different problems, sometimes not, sometimes not really connected with teaching English, but with really with dealing with all these emotional, social problems, with refugees, traumas, and so on. So are you practicing self-care? Uh, do you ask others for help when you need it? Because in this very demanding situation, um, you know, teachers need some help very often. Yeah. And we need lots of good energy to support our emotional system. Uh, in uh, very often psychology, we say that we need something called emotional agility. It's like, you know, the ability to bounce back emotionally from stressful situations, to build resilience. Yeah. And uh, first of all, what can help? acceptance yeah you even when you feel really sad you feel absolutely helpless it's okay you can feel like that it it happens but then do not immerse in this negative emotion just accept it because you have the right to feel like that but then it's important to do something about it so how do you take care of yourself this is a very important question because without that you can't help anyone if you don't take care of yourself yeah self compassion so as I said, acceptance of all types of emotions, try, trying to, to ask for help when it's necessary, to build really like a support network and believe in goodness. I do believe that people are good and sometimes when they are not nice, if they are not behaved the proper way, probably there is a reason why they behave like that. And also try to learn a little bit more about your fear writing down the, the, the journal, which we, which we have already discussed, will help you too. Because then that you can understand, you have a better insight, internal insight in your uh, mental and emotional health. You Definitely, you need good, positive relationships, guys. I think uh, the COVID uh, proved how loneliness can be dangerous and how it how it affected many many people's health in, uh, mental health have some people around you if you are, have the family that's great right but if you don't have really close family if you don't have relatives just build a network build build a nice community around you so acceptance and being close to people and again there are lots of different strategies to manage anxiety. When you when you look at uh, the reasons why you why you feel fear, why you are uh, anxious, then you can understand what processes are happening in your head, what uh, what is going on. Another thing is to resist some cognitive uh, cognitive traps. We very often when we are under stress, we get into some cognitive uh, cognitive uh, traps. One of them is like we are called we sometimes we call them like mental errors, such like catastrophic thinking. So you think only about the worst possible outcome, and you believe that you won't won't be able to cope with it. Or another trap, tunneling, that you pay attention only to the ne negative aspects of the situation, and you ignore totally everything what is good. So stop hanging in your thoughts, yes? Live in a moment, appreciate little things, control things you can. You can control what you will do tomorrow. You can control uh, if you smile or not to somebody who you meet, many other things. And it's important to take care of your own resources. Ask yourself how you take care of your own resources because they are not, you know, unlimited. If you don't take care of them, there will be a moment that they will finish. So, and this, this feeling of being able to control something gives you the sense of agency. And there is nothing worse like, you know, the feeling that you can't do anything. Then we feel completely lost. Here you have the, um, uh, the, um, the link to the page, to website, uh, which was uh, prepared by Professor Bernstein, who works with refugee students, and he created actually the mindfulness-based trauma recovery for refugees. It's a big project where, where you can find lots of different uh, different elements there and uh, very useful uh, useful ideas. But um, what what I want to say is just that. Uh, we, the world is 
difficult yes we have been facing lots of different uh, fears and and uh, uncertain situations so we need to learn how to do, be more tolerant for uncertainty yeah and uh, you know one of the elements which will help us in that is just taking care of ourselves self compassion exercises yes uh taking care of your physical emotional and mental well-being uh just practicing yoga maybe or meditation or mindfulness something like that there are many different uh, exercises you can take but um there is impossible to talk about all of them but i would like you now to invite uh i will read you a story it will somehow connect my talk to uh, to the session uh before me uh, done by by patrick so i would like you to close your eyes just sit very comfortably okay sit, sit comfortably and i would like you to listen to the story um a young girl was walking along a beach upon which thousands of starfish had been washed up during a terrible storm when she came to each starfish, she would pick it up and throw it back into the ocean. And people watch her with amusement because she was keeping doing it, doing it, doing it. So she had been doing this for some time when a man, an old elderly man, approached her and said, Little girl, why are you doing this? Look at this beach. You can't save all this starfish. The girl seemed crushed, suddenly, suddenly deflated. Uh, but after a few moments, she bent down, picked up another starfish and hurled it as far as she could into the ocean. Then she looked up at the man and replied, Well, I made a difference for that one. So the old man looked at the girl inquisitively and thought about what she had done and what she had said. Being inspired, he joined the little girl in throwing starfish big into this, back into the sea. And then after some time, other people joined and many more starfish were saved. So you can open your eyes. And as Patrick said, we you can begin to make a difference. And I think if we have just one newcomer, one refugee in our classroom, you can make a big difference to this child. Sometimes we think that uh, we can't change this world, but I do believe that we can. We can make a difference. So being more empathetic, being open to all these kids and showing acceptance, unconditional acceptance will make a difference. And we can create a better world we want to live in in the future. I'm a big fan of positive psychology and positive education. And I think that teachers are just, sometimes they, they don't even understand how powerful they might be because they create the future generations. And even today, we are in a big community governed by Oxford University Press. And look how many of us are present here. If we all make a difference, the difference will be bigger and bigger. So um, I would like you, I would like to finish telling you that, first of all, you have to take care of your own resources. You have to take care of yourselves just to be able to give more energy and more positivity to your students. But be also very mindful because it's very easy not to notice, to ignore something which can be then very dangerous for the child. So thank you very much for being here and joining me. And if you have any questions, I can answer because, of course, I can talk more about different exercises, but maybe um, you have some, some questions you want me to answer. Thank you so much, Alicia. That was so good. Um, just an amazing, inspiring talk. Um, if you head over to the Q&A section, can you see that on your screen? Oh, you should right. be able to see some of the questions. We've got quite a lot to get okay. through. But Okay, wait, I will do, okay, can we use the hero journey frame to present perfect? Yeah, of course, you know, the hero journey framework is good because when you, them, oh, come on, I, it's which I okay. get, yes, yes, but I have, 
I can't display and Q and A. It went back to chat. Uh, shall I read some out to you? Would that be Yeah, easier? can you read it to me? Yeah. Uh, could you suggest a good emotional activity to start a class with? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think, oh, great, thank you. Ah. Uh, <laughs> I think the easiest one, you can just do like visualization exercise, yes? So you, it will take like two, three minutes. You can ask your students to close their eyes and, and then they can visualize the place probably they have already been in or they would like to be where they would feel really safe and nice uh, and go to that. Or you can do like exercise when you actually actually do like guided visualization. I sometimes use like the waterfall that, you know, I ask students to, to imagine that uh, we, are, we are suddenly in a place close to a beautiful, beautiful waterfall, which, you know, the water goes down and takes all uh, emotions which you don't need. And you can fill yourself with some positive emotions which the clean water from waterfall will give you. Many different things. But I think um, you, you can even uh, start the, the class with some drawing. It depends, of course, on the age of your students that they can draw um, an animal and try ask them, how is the animal feeling today? Could you just, you know, use the proper color, color, or you know, you can add something to your drawing and just demonstrate and represent? Because of course, even they, when they, they they are going to draw the animal, there would be them. Yeah. So something like that. Thank you. Um, another question we have is how to approach a student during a panic attack. Any tips mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. that? Yes. Very often, when you have a student with panic attack. Uh, there's no sense to talk much to this person. It's good to hug the child. You know, maybe you can take the child somewhere out of the classroom, allow him to sit down. Sometimes the child will be crying, but you need to assure that I'm here. You are safe. Just saying, saying really, really uh, very simple thing that you don't have to worry. I'm here. You are safe. Sit down and, you know, and breathe. Or you can do also some briefing exercise that you can demonstrate and the child, the student will breathe with you. It depends, again, if it's an adult or a child, but generally uh, there is no sense to talk a lot when the person has a panic attack. You just need to be there, sometimes just hold the hand, hug the person, just, just give them the, the sense of safety. Thank you. Another question here. Um, what do we do exactly if despite all efforts the learner does doesn't still want to connect mm -hmm. yeah it very you know uh, sometimes it takes time yeah there are many kids who will not connect and then it will take them like even a few months to connect just leave the person alone but always uh, you know make sure that they know that you are available yeah that you you are there to listen to them. Sometimes you can ask after the after the lesson, uh, how was the lessons or how are you feeling today? Um, you know you can't push the child because you know remember that it's very very individual. Some kids or some people will go through trauma very quickly, but sometimes you know it will take just ages or they will never be the same even. I haven't mentioned it, but some people even grow through trauma. We talk about uh, uh, post-traumatic growth, that they can learn more, being more resilient, they can learn more emotional agility, but some of them will never go back to this state as they functioned before the trauma. It's really complicated, but if somebody doesn't want to connect or give them the task which is not very, um, which doesn't require the exposition, you know, sometimes they can do something individually. That's that's really difficult, but I have been working a lot uh, through process drama, as, as you, Kate, mentioned at the very beginning. Uh, if you want, if you are interested, you can look at the book Process Drama, and you know, um, published by Bloomsbury, because there are lots of practical scenarios also how to work with refugees through drama. Sometimes it's good to create even like, like the fictional metaphorical reality because then then students feel safer because they think that they are not themselves. They play the character, but actually they play themselves. And this uh, the drama gives them like umbrella of safety that you, you don't feel so much exposed. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so another question here, how can we balance making a safe space for students dealing with trauma to learn and to not be too overbearing for the student who might feel like they're being treated like glass? Mm -hmm. Now, you, it, it's a very good question. Thank you for that. We can't exaggerate, guys, because if you treat somebody like very carefully, it, it might be even worse for him. Because what I try to say, the most important thing is just to empower the students, just to show them that they have the power to change. They have the power to function normally. Because if we are too, or, or if, if we are oversensitive, this kid will always feel different, which is not good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You have to be like natural, of course. Be mindful. Be be very caring, but not uh, not. To exaggerate that you know you are special we have to treat you differently because imagine how would you feel if all people in the group will treat you all the time differently you will feel different and you will feel that you don't belong to this group thank you um and then another one here about um if this behavior is evident in five to six year olds how's the best way to speak to that though that sort of age group mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah that's of course you know sometimes you need to ask for help because sometimes uh, you know there will be a mixture of different kind of behavior and the teacher can't uh, can't cope with it so either if you see that it's getting into this direction, it's good to uh, ask a psychologist, school psychologist or a pedagogue for help to take this kid and talk separately because, you know, you can also talk to parents, yeah, because uh, if, if, if you can't really do anything about it after a few conversations with the child, it's good to talk to the parents because sometimes, again, we don't know what's happening in the family. And maybe sometimes even very young kids, they, they demonstrate different even sexual behavior because something like that is happening in the family and they, they are modeling. Mm -hmm. So it's good to uh, have contact with the family or sometimes ask, you know, therapist to, to support you a little bit. Don't be afraid to ask for help because we can't solve all problems ourselves. Yeah. Thank you. And then one last question here. How can a teacher get help for emotional trauma? How, how teachers can help? Yeah, how can teachers get help? Where, where's the best place for them to go? I think teachers, if they, they experience trauma, because I think it could be different trauma, you know, it can be a refugee trauma, but also our personal traumas. I think um, sometimes it's really necessary to have therapy even a few sessions, because we don't want to um, talk about our traumas with the relatives, because somehow very often, as from my experience, teachers do, don't want to drag their families into their traumas. So they need somebody who has a completely neutral approach and they can talk to them. Um, you know, uh, we are all very different and definitely we have the right to ask for, to ask for help. So sometimes if you experience trauma, you need to go through it. You need to experience it again. You have to get get rid of all these emotions, accept them, but then work on them. If the better insight you have, you know, sometimes we are not even aware why we're experiencing trauma because, you know, one trauma can uh, be caused or can be triggered by event which happened years, years ago or trauma you're experiencing now will put you back, will take you back to your past where you were like an abandoned child many other things. So it depends, of course, on a very specific situation. But if something like that uh, happens to you or you feel like that, it's good to, to ask for help and go for therapy. Thank you so much for that. I think we've been through the majority of the questions. There are a couple okay. more, but um, I think that is most of them. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for such an informative talk. It's it was just amazing, so inspiring, so many useful practical takeaways that we can use in our classrooms. Um, I know I know that when I was teaching, I used the um, worry jar, and it worked mm -hmm. really well. So mm -hmm. I highly recommend that one. <laughs> so you know, you had the proof. <laughs> yeah, lots of people were asking <laughs> about the um, blob tree yeah. as well, which yeah, is, blob tree really, is great. really great. And I you can you can you can also find it in 
internet, the blob tree. Of course, if anybody wants, you know, maybe from from Oxford, you, uh, you can ask me for some interpretation because when you observe the tree in psychology, we can analyze each position because it has a certain meaning. But for the for the sake of the classroom, you can ask, you can just copy it because there are uh, they are available copies in internet, and you can give each child or each student a blob tree, and then they can work in pairs. They can first uh, you know choose the position but also they can analyze different positions what they mean you know lots of different uh, inspiration and you can use it in, differently but it's quite useful because it's again it gives you the distance so you don't have to talk uh, about yourself you talk about the figure on the tree how the figure feels you know which helps mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so Thank you. much for that. That was so great. And everyone, you, you've got so many lovely comments. Um, so thank, thank you. you very much.